Um, well, thank you for that. Uh, I want to thank um, Michelle Bartlett for coercing me and to finally agreeing to do this. When I saw that there was a Supreme Court justice coming here, I can only assume that Michelle Bartlett would not allow the Supreme Court even to turn her down because she can be relentless. Um, as far as uh, the whitewater kayaking, it has actually become too scary for me. Uh, we have a saying, and when you do something like that, if you can't pass the spit test, you don't do it anymore. And that means if you can't make enough spit when you're looking at the rapids to go down them, then you shouldn't go down the rapids at all. Um, and it's kind of actually a good thing for, I, I think, anything we do in life. You know, if we're doing something and we just can't generate enough saliva to get to think we can do it, we probably should uh, not do it. I know there's at least one dentist here to keep me honest. Um, I do have a disclaimer because when I'm talking about the different options that there are for replacing teeth, I put in costs. Now, Costs are something that these are all just guesses. Uh, some of them are based on national surveys. Um, but I will tell you that whenever you see costs and you live in Alaska, you always just assume that whatever the top number is, that's probably where you start uh, here. Um, and just as an example, um, I was talking with a guy earlier today, and he was thinking about going somewhere foreign to get some dental implants done. So he asked me, well, where's the cheapest place in the world to go? It turns out, as far as I know, if you go to Croatia, uh, you can get your dental implant and everything done for about $850. Um, you know, here in Alaska or in a lot of places, $850 allows you to have some x-rays taken and we can talk to you about implants, but you know, you're not anywhere near to having the actual thing. Um, I don't want you to think this is just an implant um, discussion because I'm going to cover everything. Uh, usually when patients come into the office, what they want to know is what are their options. Now, a lot of people, just because of what I do, they are, they're interested in dental implants. But whenever you talk to someone about treatment in any field, uh, you have to give people all the options. And you explain to them why some options are good, some options are bad, pros and cons, advantages, disadvantages. And so, uh, again, as I'm going through here, the one thing you should always keep in mind that as I'm talking... I'm assuming that the person I'm talking about is someone that is in good health um, and doesn't have any major issues as far as medications or, or uh, anything else. So, you know, we're considering the healthy individual. Um, nothing substitutes, obviously, for actually going in, seeing your dentist, because then they can look at you as you, the total person, and then they can uh, figure out, you know, exactly what direction is going to be best and what options are going to be available based on you as a person. Um, when I teach residents, we always talk about, we give them all these piles of literature and they study all this stuff. Um, and there's lots of percentages, like we know the nerve, for instance, is going to be a certain percentage of the time in a certain location in the jaw. Well, that's wonderful that you know that the nerve is going to be somewhere in general in the jaw. But if you're talking about putting an implant in, for instance, and you don't know exactly where that nerve is, you're not going to be able to go to court and tell somebody, well, I know 50% of the time it's supposed to be here. Well, the flip side is 50% of the time it's somewhere else, and you don't want to find it in that somewhere else. Um, do I just push the keyboard? Okay. Um, just a couple of examples. I don't know if, if the lights were down a little bit. Can we turn down lights? How do you turn? What's that? Um, if you keep it going down, because there, is, there's a lot of visuals here for you to look at. Um, as I was thinking about the different ways that teeth have been replaced uh, throughout history, um, the top left picture is actually George Washington's dentures. And you can go to Mount Vernon, and they have them in a little case uh, suspended there. Uh, he actually had a variety of different dentures. That was the latest or maybe his uh, uh, nicest one. But you can see they actually use natural teeth. They managed to stick them in there. It's got a little hinge device or some springs. Um, I'm not really sure how it worked. I don't know if you had like a spring mechanism or something because um, it looks like it, it would be difficult for you to get anything done with that. I um, mean, he probably used them mostly for um, pictures, um, things like that. I do know that uh, his second inauguration during his speech, he had to cut it back to like 125 words. That's all he said. And part of the reason was is he was in so much pain wearing these things that that's all he could get out before he had to quit. Um, the bottom left over here, we can see what the uh, Egyptians used to do. And you can see they had very elaborate uh, ways of putting teeth back in. They coiled wire around everything. 
Um, obviously, they're still using the teeth, maybe the ones that came out of there. Um, one of the nice things that is a, a periodontist, which is somebody that worries about the gums a lot, that I really like wires down there because it's going to cause gum disease. If you want to cause gum disease, stick something like that next to the gums, and that can guarantee that you'll have to come see me. Um, the other one over there is actually made out of wood, and in Japan, uh, they actually were very good. They had artisans that would take wood, and um, all, I mean, they could make impressions, and then these things actually could function fairly well. Um, the only problem with wooden dentures is that as we age, you know, things change, and dentures don't fit. Anyone that's ever had a denture or knows someone that does know that they don't fit well forever. There comes a point when you have to replace these things or reline them. But back in those days, there was no good way to reline things. Um, this just shows that, you know, there have been things going on for as long as man has been losing teeth. They've been trying to figure out ways to replace them. Uh, I was just talking with, and I forgot, Tiffany, that, um, you know, she's a nutritionist. And so, you know, one of the things that we talk about when we're trying to get the medical insurance to pay for a dental implant, for instance, is we talk about uh, nutrition and the ability to, to eat properly and to eat the things that are healthy for us. And it turns out if you don't have teeth, it's very difficult to do those things. Um, you can see kind of the timeline. 1951 is when uh, Brandemark first uh, discovered that bones like titanium and tends to just lock into the surface. And since that time, uh, things have moved forward. The first dental implants were in the 60s. Um, I was fortunate in my residency that we actually had a man who, a uh, general dentist, um, who had trained back in the 60s with Branamark, and uh, he was um, one of the faculty members we were fortunate enough to have because he you know, brought a historical uh, viewpoint along with his you know, entire dental career. So he's seen everything um, that we've had from dentures all the way to the implants. Um, how common is tooth loss? And it turns out tooth loss is really, really common. Um, you can see that roughly half the, well, actually more than half of the adults in the United States are missing teeth. On average, an adult has between 24 and 25 teeth. Um, and so that means, if you don't count wisdom teeth, which we routinely take out now, they're missing, on average, three or four teeth. Um, so it's a big problem, or at least it's a, it's a common occurrence. Uh, 35 million Americans have no teeth. And for that particular group, uh, that is a big problem because if you don't have any teeth, again, your diet is very limited. Um, and this bottom one here about what teeth are you going to keep, it's always the ones down here on the bottom. And the reason that people always have these teeth is you think about your, your jaw here. It's like a big horseshoe that sticks out here. If this thing wasn't really hard and solid, it would break all the time. And it's especially true right here. There's this big old lump of bone that's about as hard a bone as anywhere in the skull. And the teeth that happen to be right down here are the ones that typically are there uh, as we age. Even if you lose everything else, that's what you're going to have. Okay. Um, factors involved in tooth loss. So just real quickly, age. You know, I'm 55 now. I'm still waiting for somebody to come in my office and tell me that something physical actually gets better as I get older. Because as far as I can tell, nothing gets better. And if you look at any study on anything related to dental field, medical field, uh, it's never good news. It's never like, oh, when you hit 60, suddenly your knees are going to be way better uh, or something like that. And so age is always a factor. Um, this picture is actually someone who has a drug abuse problem. And I don't know if um, methamphetamines had become a problem up here in Alaska at all, but down in Seattle, uh, it's a huge problem. And you would see people that would come in, and, you know, that's their mouth. And that's actually not a really bad case. A lot of times their mouths are completely gone. And it's because, one, they're not taking care of them, but also it's because of the, the habit they have. Um, it turns out there is a racial difference. Um, as far as tooth loss. African Americans tend to, on average, have about one fewer, well, one tooth fewer than um, uh, whites and Asians. Uh, and now that could be socioeconomic. You know, why that is, I don't know for certainty. Uh, smoking is a big deal. 
uh, you know, smoking is not good for anything. Um, we've had people that come in, and, and I always notice that when we, somebody does a medical history, they'll fill it out and they'll tell me, you know, there's a question on there, how much do you smoke? And when I first started out, I was really naive because I actually believed that what people put on those pieces of paper were real. Well, the best example of how much uh, smoking is underestimated is we had a gentleman come in and uh, he said he smoked a pack a day. And I thought, oh, well, a pack a day, you know, that's not good. You should cut back. But, you know, we can work with that. And everything, nothing we did worked on this guy. It always failed. So finally, I'm out there, and I'm shaking my head, and I, and I talk to his wife. I should have asked his wife first. I, as a matter of fact, I've actually considered having wives or spouses fill out the other one's medical history because they always tell the truth. So it turned out that he wasn't smoking just a pack a day. After she finished laughing at me when I told her that, she then went on to say, on a bad day, he will smoke almost a carton of cigarettes. Now, a carton of cigarettes, that's a lot of cigarettes. That's 10 packs, 20 in a pack. That's 200 cigarettes. And, you know, if you do the math, he's smoking, he's puffing these things down in minutes. And uh, so I, I kind of questioned that. I said, really? And she said, as soon as he wakes up, he starts smoking. If he doesn't take a shower that, way, that day, which is the only re time he doesn't smoke, he kept smoking through that. And if he was really, really nervous, she said he could, really, he could destroy a whole cigarette in minutes. And, you know, it's just shocking. Um, needless to say, that guy had other problems, and we stopped all treatment, and we had him go see a physician. I don't know how things turned out for him, uh, but I can tell you if he still smokes that much, you know, you know, he may not be with us any longer. Um, income is always something. Education is always a, a factor because, you know, the more money we have, generally the more access we have to care. Uh, the higher level of education, we're more aware of care typically, and also income and education go hand in hand. Um, systemic disease is another thing that uh, plays a big role in what happens, not so much with cavities, but with tooth, teeth being lost. Um, the most common thing is diabetes. Uh, you know, when they changed the definition of diabetes, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, uh, it created another, you know, 10 million diabetics instantly. Um, and the problem is, is that it can, can, continues to increase and people don't know they have diabetes. So now you have something that's going on systemically that's going to have an impact on your body to uh, heal and to fight infection. And our mouths are full of bacteria. Uh, they, you know, the guesstimate is somewhere between 500 to more than 1,000 different organisms live in the oral cavity. And uh, for any of you that you know, follow the news or are in sciences that might uh, be going into this realm, uh, there's the microbiome, which is everything that's microscopic that lives on and in us. And, you know, some estimates are there are 10 times as many of those on and in us than there are actually cells in our entire body. And so we have this entire universe that we walk around with. And uh, actually now there's a lot of research that's suggesting that they play a role in a lot of things. You know, our mood, our health. Um, and so uh, systemic diseases are critical. Um, and, you know, just the realization that there are all these things now that are connected to what's going on are so important. Genetics, uh, usually with periodontal disease, we figure that about half of what we see with um, uh, the gum problems are genetic. Uh, and then the other half are split up between um, not getting care uh, and smoking. Smoking's the other big one. Um, of course, you can have trauma to lose a tooth. Decay, very common. Um, and then attrition, that's just wearing them out. And we all probably know someone or, you know, where the teeth are just flat, and it's because they've been well used, um, but at some point they become non-functional. Um, that last one was interesting only because uh, it was a recent study that came out, and it just kind of shows you, you know, where are the missing teeth. Alaska actually does quite well on this. We're in the uh, I think we're in the second category, so only 8 to 9%. Um, so, you know, whatever we're doing up here, we're doing well. Um, consequences of losing a tooth. Probably the biggest consequence is if you lose a tooth, 20% of the time you're going to lose another tooth. And as you keep losing teeth, uh, again, the reason why people end up with just teeth down here is because this is where all the solid bone is. If you compared your jaw bones to pieces of wood, this is oak, this up here is pine and sometimes balsa. So you can imagine if you're walking around with a balsa jaw that 
things, if they get infected or anything goes on, some inflammatory process is allowed to go for a period of time, the balsa is gone. And then you have to figure out, well, how you're going to replace those. Um, you know, ev everyone likes hockey, it seems like. And so that's Gordie Howe from a long time ago, showing off his famous smile there. Um, if you treat, now let's say you do something. So we know 20% of the time, if you do nothing, you're going to lose more teeth. If you do something, at least 10% of the time, you're still going to lose more teeth. If you do something that comes in and out, now we're really looking at poor odds because 44% of the time, something's going to fail when you're missing um, several teeth and you're using some type of removable appliance. And the reason is simple. You know, for the engineers, it's obvious. If you put something in your mouth and it can move, every time it moves, it wants to put a little torquing force on a tooth. Um, teeth don't like torquing forces, and as a result, they tend to get loose. And that's why you know, people tend to lose, especially if you lose molars, you start losing teeth forward. Um, what, what were those yep, go back. Like oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, FPD, that is a bridge. That's where you've taken, you have, th let's say, three teeth in a row, the middle one is missing, and then you're going to cut the two teeth on either sides, and you're going to put something that bridges or spans that gap, and it's glued in, basically. So it does not come in and out. RPD, the R is just removable. So fixed partial denture and removable partial denture. So if the removable types of appliances um, carry with it, obviously, a big risk. <coughs> Um, and then the other thing, if you lose a tooth, and we hear this all the time, people come in and they say, you know what, when I was 20, my teeth were perfect. And now, you know, 20 years later, they lost a tooth, and now everything is kind of moving around, uh, and they're not happy about that. Uh, because once teeth don't have partners next to them like this, well, now they're free to do things. And they can also move up and down if they don't have a partner above them. Teeth like, you know, they're social. They like to have teeth around them. And if they don't have teeth around them, they just, you know, do crazy things. Um, this just shows what happens to bone. You know, the other big thing that happens whenever we lose teeth is that you think about it, your teeth are not just like a post with concrete around them. Teeth are actually suspended in a ligament. And so when you bite, forces are transmitted through that ligament into the bone. So your body knows that if you have teeth, that if it can, it should maintain bone around them because you're using them. If you don't have a tooth, what will happen as you go through time is you'll start to develop little indentations, little divots, concavities, things like that. And the problem with those types of, uh, uh, of outcomes is you lose enough bone, you don't have a lot of options. You know, now if you lose a whole bunch of bone, a denture is just going to float in that space. A floating denture is not good for anything except for maybe cosmetics. Um, if you lose enough bone, you don't have an opportunity to put an implant in because there's not enough jaw left there or there's the risk of fracture. Um, and we've seen people try to put implants in places where the bone is very, very short and it's very narrow. And what you get to see when you have that done is lots of fractures because you've now created a really weak point in the bone, wherever it is. So there is a consequence of doing nothing um, when you have a space. Uh, not all teeth are created equal. Do I have something to point with here? No. I could just jump or I'll throw things at a tooth. Um, if you look at these screens, though, what you'll see are back teeth, all the molars here. All of them have multiple roots. The bottom teeth have two roots, and you can see them pretty well there. Um, the top teeth actually have three roots. Now, from a structural standpoint, it really makes sense to have three roots on top because this is the pine or balsa. Having two roots on the bottom makes sense because this is granite or oak. So, you know, it's designed very well. Um, if you lose the third tooth from the back here, so the back ones are wisdom teeth, which we typically don't have anyway. If you lose what we call the first molar, um, that really sets you up for problems. Those teeth are critical because you can see once you get in front of those molars, all the teeth have only one root. And so a one-rooted tooth is not structurally as strong as the multi-rooted tooth. And now all your chewing is done on something that's like putting a post outside your front door. And if every day you walk out and do this, eventually the thing wobbles all over the place and can fall down. And that's why you start to lose teeth 
in front of that. So that first molar is really important. If you lose the molars behind the first molar, it doesn't really matter. If you lost, well, assuming you don't even have the wisdom teeth, if you lose the second molar, it only results in a loss of about 5% of your chewing efficiency, especially since we don't really, you know, our, our lives don't depend on us cracking bones or anything else. You know, our diets are soft enough that if you're missing those, um, you don't even need to worry about it. And a lot of times in dentistry, when we're talking about restoring someone to full function, um, we don't even think about the teeth that are farther back. We stop where that first molar is because we know that from a functional standpoint, that's about as far as you have to go. Um, the other teeth that we always worry about are the, these eye teeth, the cuspids, um, and mainly because you can't see it as well, but they have really long, strong roots. And so as you, as, when you have those, they kind of protect the front teeth, and they give you something to anchor things against. And so, you know, they are valuable. But depending on the tooth you lose also is a big driving force as far as what you should be thinking about when you need to replace something. Um, so these are the options. Let's just say we're missing one tooth. And then, you know, so you're one of the 178 million Americans. You're missing one or, or more teeth. And so really you have three choices. You've got something you can take in and out. You have something that can be in there permanently, but it's attached to the teeth on either side of the gap. Or you can put a dental implant in there and not touch the teeth that are on either side of the gap. So we're going to go through them one at a time. So the removable denture. Um, this top one is a replica of something the Romans used to make. Uh, so, you know, when you lost teeth, you can see how they have the little uh, bracket or uh, they could go over the teeth and they can slide those down on there. Um, and, you know, there probably would be a little bit of function there. Uh, again, they're still using natural teeth, so I don't know if those are that guy's natural teeth or, you know, if he's a wealthy guy, if he had a slave, he just took that person's teeth. But somehow they got teeth to put in these things. And they're actually pretty impressive, the uh, art, you know, the, the crafts, craftsmanship in them. The one on the right is something more traditional that we do now. It's made out of plastic and metal. Um, you can see that on the front here, there's a little wire that kind of loops around that one tooth right there, and that's to help to provide a little bit of, of stability to the denture. Um, the problem with these dentures uh, are especially true as far as the torquing, because as you can imagine, there is no back tooth anywhere. So if you chew in the back, that's going to push down back there, and it's going to torque these guys up here. And so, you know, it's a, something we'd like to avoid if we can. Um, so what is the reason to get a partial denture? Well, you've got to have a tooth missing. No one ever gets a partial denture unless they're missing something. Um, you don't object to having something that comes in and out. Some people actually prefer that. They like things that they can take in and out. Um, gag reflex is really important. If you're a person that, you know, you gag really easily, this is not going to be something you're going to enjoy because every time you try to put it in your mouth, you're going to be dry heaving. When I was in dental school, I had, uh, we used to have to do everything on each other in dental school before we actually got to pick on real people because as a dental student, you're not really a real person until you finish, um, at least back then. And uh, my partner was a guy who had an incredibly strong gag reflex. And so whenever we had to do something to each other, I don't really have much of one. So he could do what he needed to do with impressions, put all the goo in. Didn't matter if he took an impression of my lung, I wasn't going to gag. But on him, all you had to do was start getting something close to his mouth, and he was gagging. And then uh, he was a trooper, i got to say, but I watched him many times standing over a gigantic garbage can just gagging as we were trying to do something. And so a strong gag reflex, you just can't use these kind of devices because you're going to be very unhappy. And what usually happens if you have a strong gag reflex and you have one of these, um, either you're really good with a Dremel and you cut off most of it, or you end up throwing it in a drawer. Um, you don't really want to have the gummy smile with these because you'll see all the plastic. And so when you smile, you know, people's eyes will go from your eyes and they'll go down and they'll be wondering, what the heck is that pink stuff there? And, and then, the, of course, the nice wires going around. Um, if they don't know what a denture looks like, they're going to think you're doing something really strange. If they do know what a denture is, then they'll know that's what it is. Um, there aren't a whole lot of contraindications, though, other than what we have right there. And I actually haven't put any slides up here that say contraindications for anything, because really contraindications are just the opposite of what I'm telling you indications are. 
So I figure you guys are smart enough, no reason to just say the opposite on another slide. If I was trying to kill time, though, I would do that. Um, no reason that this is important whatsoever except that you realize that if you're having a denture made, um, especially in the traditional manner, it is a very involved process. I mean, there are, I think it stops at like 15, 14 steps, no, 15 steps. And then, of course, there's the 16th step, which is the repeated adjustments over and over again until you get it just right. Because anyone that's had to wear a, a denture knows that there are sore spots and everything else. I know Dr. Waller has probably had lots of fun experiences adjusting these things because it's one of those things you adjust it and you get rid of one sore spot and then another day later there's a new sore spot because when you adjusted it, it took the pressure off one spot, but now there's pressure somewhere else. So there are a lot of steps involved in a denture. And so, you know, nobody likes to pay for, for dentures. I mean, they're expensive, but there's a reason why they're expensive. These things, one, you know, there's a lab cost, but there's a huge time factor involved with these. You know, if ever we get lucky enough and something actually just fits, I mean, we would all sing and dance if we could actually sing and dance because that's how happy you are because you don't have to do anything else because most of the time you know, oh, you know, I'm going to have to see this person 15 times to try to get it to, to be right. Um, now we're into the price thing. And uh, I was talking with a colleague across the hall from me to, um, yesterday, found out these prices are all way too low. So... I'm just going to say we'll ignore the top ones. We're only worried about the bottom. If you're going to get a removable partial denture, um, it's going to be somewhere between $700 and infinity. Um, the $700 one is just a plastic thing, and we call them flippers. They are actually cosmetic devices, and that's about it. Um, to get something like where we had the metal and everything, of course, those cost quite a bit more. Um, and so they're going to be at least a couple thousand dollars. I don't know what insurance reimbursement is on something like that. Um, you know, insurance companies, I feel like their primary job is to not give any money out, if at all possible. And when they do, they never give you enough. Uh, and one of the problems with dental insurance is dental insurance has been the same forever, which means that's kind of like your wage never changed. So if your wage never changed, you're actually poorer now than you were back when you first started making that wage because everything else has gone up. And so, you know, there is a big discrepancy there. I don't know how it'll be managed, um, but it is a problem. Um, so pros and cons. Uh, so 56% success rate, and that's for a period of about 10 to 15 years. So we know that by about the 10 or 15th year, either the thing has broken, your mouth has changed enough that it doesn't fit, a tooth has been lost, um, or you've just decided to do something else because you're tired of taking it in and out. Um, the problem with anything you take in and out is they're easy to lose. Um, I know people that have been dumpster diving and everything else because they've gone to a restaurant or somewhere, and they took the thing out, and they put it in a napkin, and then they left it there. And then the person comes through, throws it all in the garbage. I've heard horror stories about being in the hospital. And, of course, there, you know, they, they, they put you out under general anesthesia, and they've taken your denture, and I've heard of those things disappearing. And, you know, it's kind of a big deal because, one, now you're going to wake up and you have no teeth and maybe you don't have any teeth at all. So right off the bat, you're compromised. You can't even eat because it's gone. And then you have the cost of getting another one made because I've never heard of a hospital actually saying, oh, you know what, we threw that away by accident, so we're going to buy you a new one. I haven't heard that one. So, But a success rate this low over 10 to 15 years, and I'm going to tell you, there are always outliers. There are people that will have had the same denture forever. You know, they had it made back in 1920, and it's still perfect. It's better than they are. And so, you know, it's possible that you're going to have a really, really good result, but it's not probable. And so uh, with that low success rate, you know, if you're a gambler, that's not so good. That means you lose most of the time, um, and you're going to have to do something else. And if you wait long enough and you lose other teeth, the something else always becomes so much more expensive. So now we're going to go to things that don't come out of the mouth. I just love the, the wire ingenuity there. I think that's pretty amazing. Um, and then up in the upper right, of course, is a, uh, and, you know, a rendition of what it's like. You can see that there are two teeth, and then there's an empty space between them. And those teeth don't look like teeth anymore because they've been ground down so that they can put the bridge on top of those. And then they secure that with cement. This has been the way that 
probably the way of replacing a single tooth or even multiple teeth for you know decades. Um, I don't know when the first bridge was done, but you know this has been the bread and butter, the standard of care forever until most recently. So you know when can you do this? Uh, you know you need to have healthy supporting teeth. You don't want to build a bridge on two piers that are terrible. And so you can't have bad teeth on either side of that. Otherwise, you're just going to spend a bunch of money. You're going to put that on there, and then it's going to fall out. And then you're going to figure out what you're going to do afterwards. So there's got to be healthy teeth. Um, one thing I didn't put on here is that you need to have good oral hygiene. Because one of the problems with anything we put on or in a tooth, it's never perfect. You know, if you think about your tooth, and we call them virgin teeth, a tooth that has never had a filling and hasn't had a cavity, that enamel surface is like this countertop. You know, it's not porous, things aren't going to get in, and so you're not going to have a, um, you don't have any places for bacteria to hide readily. As soon as we cut a tooth, we create those spaces. And so the number one reason that people, as they get older, have um, cavities and things is because we're fixing old cavities, they're getting cavities on top of the cavities. We call it recurrent decay. And a crown, if you think about it, it's kind of like if you had a hat. You take a hat and you fill it up with water and if you stick it on your head, well, no matter how well that hat fits, you're going to have water leak it, leaking out around the, the rim of the hat. And so when you put a crown on top of a tooth, there's going to be a microscopic gap. Now, I don't know what the resin cements now, because those are better than the cements we had before. And I don't know if Dr. Waller knows, but anyway, we, because the cements are better, it's not as big of an issue. But you can imagine, if you leave a gap of 20 microns, which was the average gap for a traditional crown or a bridge, it doesn't sound like a whole lot. You know, 20 microns, gosh, I can't see 20 microns. That's tiny. But that 20 microns means that bacteria that cause tooth decay, which are only about 4 microns, I mean, that's like the Grand Canyon. They can go in there. They can set up shop. They can party every single day. They don't care if you brush your teeth because your bristles aren't fitting in that 20 micron gap. So as a result, the whole thing is susceptible to decay. And now if you've got a bridge and you've got that third tooth in the middle, well, you've now got these two spots that are um, you know, on the inner part of the teeth that are holding the bridge that are super hard to clean because now you've got gums in the way and you've got that fake tooth in the way. And so it's a difficult place to clean. And so we know that with this type of restoration, um, when we get there, we know that the biggest reason for failure is going to be decay. And decay can re lead to fracture. Um, this is just the process. Uh, you know, if you're getting a partial denture, it might take a month to three months. And that's just a guesstimate, depending on how quick the lab gets things done and how easy it is to fit the thing. Um, for a bridge, it's quick, you know, three or four weeks, you've lost a tooth, and if it's been gone, you can go in there, and a dentist can go ahead and prepare that, they can get the impressions, they can send it off to a lab, and you're back in business within about three or four weeks. Now, it might take longer. Uh, I know that lab time, turnaround times can be a variable, and so um, that's just kind of a, a guesstimate if everything goes well. And for some offices now, they actually can mill their own um, crowns, and I don't know about bridges because I, I'm not involved with milling things, but a bridge, uh, if you can mill it, it, you know, conceivably it's something that could be done in the course of the day. <clears throat> um, so everything, you know, you want to know, well, what's the long-term prognosis? We didn't talk much about the removable partial denture because it has a terrible long-term prognosis. We already know it's almost guaranteed to fail. So what happens when you stick these bridges on there? You can see it 10 years. 10 years is what we typically will guess a bridge should last. Now, I would bet there are people in this room that have bridges or crowns that have been in their mouths longer than 10 years. And that's usually a testament to you taking good care of things and or you just don't have a high caries rate because the bacteria in our mouth also have a big influence on whether or not we're going to suffer from decay. So, you know... For the people that where they last longer, and we've seen 40, 50 year crowns, and they're still just fine. Um, a lot of them are gold. In my mind, gold still has the best margin of any restorative material. It's just nobody wants a gold tooth in the front. Um, but at 10 years is about average. Typically, insurance companies, those guys that don't like to part with any money whatsoever, they will pay for a new crown about every five years or so. So they've had an actuary figure out how long they can hold off before they have to pay for something that needs to be done. 
It's kind of like GM when they had that problem. They had an actuary figure out how many people had to die from that particular problem before it was important for them to actually try to fix it. And so, um, you know, actuaries, you know, they, they tell them, well, this is where profit is no longer going to be there. And profit is a, a thing that really drives uh, the insurance companies and things like that. Yeah? Are you talking here about bridges or crowns? Um, this is bridges, but it also applies to crowns. Um, usually the problems, though, with bridges are worse than with crowns because of the, they're more difficult to take care of. That's why it's so important that you go in, for instance, for your regular checkups. You, know, you might think, gosh, I go in there and it takes the hygienist two seconds to clean my teeth. Well, that's true, but that means you're doing a great job. But even if you're doing a great job, we don't want this expensive uh, investment to have a problem. Yeah? On that previous slide, it's mm -hmm. Let's see, let me go back. Uh, oh, oh, this right here, this is um, a case where the tooth actually is uh, salvageable. So you can see that with, you can repair, if you can repair a tooth, then you can have just a regular crown on a tooth. But in this, in the bridge case, it's where that tooth didn't make it. You know, the decay was too great or it had a problem so that it couldn't be saved. In that case, the tooth had to be taken out. And then that's when you get a bridge. That's when, because we're talking about replacing teeth. I left that on there just as a, so you could see what the normal route would be if the tooth can be kept. But yeah, that's a. Um, with crowns, t typically, uh, especially in the front here, the dentist really has an opportunity to maximize aesthetics, for instance. Because you're talking about three teeth. And so if you have a bridge right up here in the front, the beauty of that is now all three of those teeth are going to match. And they're going to match forever. And hopefully they're going to match the teeth around so that everything looks good. Um, one of the problems with bridge work, though, is that they will not change in color, but your teeth will. As we get older, and again, another downside to getting older, although I guess it's good to get older because then we're still around to talk about this stuff like we are. But um, as you get older, your teeth become... Uh, less hollow. You know, your tooth is hollow, and when you're young, you see a young person, and their teeth are so bright, you can't even hardly look at them. I think of my daughter-in-law. She was sitting over there, and I think when she smiles, it's just like, wow, those things are bright. Well, she's young, and there are large spaces inside the teeth. As she gets older, when she becomes ancient of days like myself, well, the problem is your tooth is now, some of that hollowness is gone, and so it's not as translucent, and so your tooth really didn't change color, it's just that the light doesn't pass through as easily, so it's perceived as being a different color um, because it, essentially it's thicker. Um, the nice things, again, it can be completed quickly. It doesn't have to be taken in and out. doesn't elicit a gag response. Um, although people a lot of times will report if you've been missing a tooth for a long time and you get a bridge, you know, your tongue got used to that hole being there. And when the hole is no longer there, the tongue has a hard time for a little while because it keeps bumping into that tooth thinking, what the heck is this thing? Once you get used to it, though, it's, it's just like the tooth had never been uh, lost. Um, back to the failure. Um, so decay is the big thing. These other, an abutment just means one of the teeth that are holding the bridge in place. So you can see that at 15 years, 30% of the abutments are going to have a problem, and they're going to fail. A lot of times when an abutment fails, that also means the tooth has failed because you had decay go through there, basically eat away, demineralize the whole structure underneath that crown. And so when the crown comes off, what you're left with is a little stub. And sometimes the stub can be used to build a new bridge. Other times it just has to be taken out. Um, the virgin teeth thing, again, if 80% of the time there's at least one virgin tooth on either side of this gap. So now I'm going to have to cut down a perfectly healthy tooth in order to fix um, that one missing tooth. You know, it's kind of like, gosh, I got two knees. One of my knees is not good. The other one is good. And it'd be like the doctor saying, well, you know what? Just so that we can get everything the same, I'm going to fix both your knees, even though the one is not uh, broken. So, you know, you hate to cut something that is intact, if you can help it. Um, and then this is the cost. So, and this kind of factors in what happens when you keep replacing it. And so over the course of 20 years, we're looking at something that's going to cost roughly, you know, 9000 to 18000 or more. Because every time you replace it, more time has gone by, so now everything costs more. And so, you know, you spend a lot for that. 
Um, and so while, again, there are always people that are exceptional, like yourself. I know you've had them there for how many years, you said? 55 years. So, you know, that's a wonderful example of what's not going to happen to the rest of us. Because, you know, she's done a great job, and more than likely, you know, you're going to be losing teeth um, over time. So I'm going to speed up here. Okay, so now we're at dental implants. Okay, so indications for dental implants are basically, uh, you got to have a few more things going for you if you're going to have an implant. Um, of course, you got to be missing the tooth. Uh, you have to have enough bone, you know, because now we're talking about putting a screw into something. You know, if you don't have, you know, if you got a big screw and you're trying to put it in a little piece of wood, it doesn't work. And so uh, when we talk to people and they come in and we look at these um, CT scans and things like this over here where we virtually can place an implant, and you probably can't see it very well because of the lightness and everything, but the little implant that has been virtually placed in that jaw, if you could look at it up close, you would see that there's no bone on the front of that implant. And so we know putting in the implant that would be ideal in that spot um, is going to require something different. It's going to require some bone grafting or something else. And so um, you've got to have enough bone. It's got to be tall enough, and it's got to be wide enough. When I say tall enough, you can usually, uh, in a perfect case where there's no grafting, you need to have at least 10 millimeters of height, and you need to have at least 7 or 8 millimeters of width. That would really be ideal, because then you can put a screw in there that will have good bone on either side of it, and it's something that um, will last. Um, for people that have been missing a tooth for a long time, it's almost never the case that you have enough. In this particular case, this person had been missing that front tooth for a long time, had a big divot there, and an implant was placed, but we had to do a bunch of grafting and things like that when it was put in there. Um, being healthy, uh, non-smoker is a good thing. Half a pack a day um, for our practice, we still consider them a non-smoker. When you hit a pack a day, the chances of success, so if success for a dental implant when it first goes in is 95%, if you smoke a pack a day, it drops down to about 85%. So smoking is not an absolute contraindication to placing an implant, because 85%, those are still wonderful odds. If you're going to be in Vegas and you're told you got an 85% chance of winning, well, you're probably going to take those odds. But um, it is decreased, and mainly because smoking has a big impact on blood flow, and blood is important for healing. You know, if you can't get the nutrients there and the waste materials away on the blood highway, well, you're not going to get the healing that you'd like to have. But smoking is not a big issue until you hit about the second pack, or if you want to smoke a carton, because um, we had tried to do in dental implants in this guy, carton of cigarettes means nothing is going to work no matter what you do. Um, although we do have a saying in dental implants, with dental implants, if you put it in the wrong place, it's guaranteed to be attached to the bone forever. Um, and so, and you know, believe me, I've done enough implants. I've had a few in the wrong place, and they always integrate. They're always in that bone, um, even though, you know, looking back, it'd be like, gosh, I wish that one would fail, but they never do. Um, bisphosphonates, a lot of people take bisphosphonates. And because of low bone mineral density, you might start taking it when you're osteopenic. And then certainly if you have osteoporosis, you may be on one of these class of drugs. These drugs are a problem because they alter the way bone forms and is remodeled. And if you're not going to remodel bone, or if you don't need bone to remodel, then it's great. you got more bone mineral density. But whenever you drill a hole in something or pull a tooth out, in order for it to heal, it requires the body to be able to remodel. And bisphosphonates have tipped the scale so that you don't remodel very well. And so there are problems with that for people that are primarily taking it by IV because they have cancer, because those are huge doses. This is just the fancy way we now look at everything. Everything is in 3D. Typically, when you go in to have uh, an examination for a dental implant, it's going to include some type of 3D imagery so you can find nerves and things like that. So we're not going to cause somebody to be permanently numb. Um, or we're going to have something rattling around in the sinus because those are both things that we just don't want to have happen. Um, process for an implant, it's about three to six months. This assumes there's no, the tooth is already gone, um, and you put the implant in, and the reason it's three to six months is that if you think about what an implant is, it's just a screw. If you put a screw into a piece of wood, 
you always make the hole slightly smaller than the screw so the screw will stay in there. If you make the hole bigger than the screw, the screw falls out. So with a dental implant, we prepare these holes slightly smaller than the dental implant, which is going to go in there. And so when you put that in, there is pressure. There is one thing that bone can feel. Bone won't say ouch or anything like that. If you, you don't even have to be numb if all we had to work on was the bone, because you wouldn't feel anything. But when we put the implant in there, there's pressure. And anyone that's had brace, braces knows about pressure, because when those teeth start to move, everything hurts. And then after a day or so, everything feels good again. And, it's, and everything is adjusted to that. Um, bone, in response to pressure, loosens up. So if you put the implant in there and the bone is locked around it, over the first three or four weeks, it actually loosens up, and then it locks back in. That's why normally you can't put a tooth on there right away. And I know there are ads out there, tooth in a day, tooth in an hour, tooth, you know, teeth in a minute. It's, um, it's one of those things, yeah, you might be able to have a tooth um, at one of those time periods, but either a lot of work had to go in before you had the tooth put in there, or it's a very special circumstance, because typically these things cannot be loaded right away. Um, but otherwise, it's very much like having a crown made. There's an impression involved, and then a crown can either be cemented or they can be screwed into place. So if we go back to the cost comparison, we can see that 9,000, 18,000 over 20 years, or 3,500 to 5,500, or a little more. So the implant, it's a bigger investment off at the beginning, but then as time goes by, um, that investment pays off because you're not replacing this over and over. Now there is one caveat that goes with what I've just shown you here, and that is um, the crown can have a problem. And so the implant can be perfectly fine, but if the crown has a fracture or something like that, like all prosthetics, they can break, and so then you would be paying for a new crown um, on an implant. Most of the studies kind of ignore that and trying to make you know, implants look even better, possibly, than they are from an economic standpoint. Um, because they're so successful, with a 95% or higher um, success rate, and success is a measurement of the implant being there and whatever the prosthesis is also being there. Um, and so that's a very high rate over 10 years. And so because of that, um, dental implants have, at least there's the talk of them being the new standard of care. So bridges are the way we used to always do it. Now we like dental implants if they can be done because now we have something that doesn't impact the other teeth and should last you uh, a lifetime. Um, as an example, in our practice, if we put an implant in there, I expect it to be there your whole life. If it's not, I replace it at no charge. Now, if I'm 90 and I can't see and my hands shake all over the place, you don't want me to replace that. But short of that, um, I guess my middle son over there is thinking about doing this. So I will then pass that all off onto him so then he can fix all the things that, you know, were successes during my lifetime, but, but then failed. Um, and then if we just put it all together, we can see 56, 81, 90, and that's over about 15 year period. So, and the 90 over there, the only reason it's not higher is that because that includes prosthetic failures as well. That means the crown that goes on the, the implant. Um, I'm gonna quickly go through dentures because I can see I'm already going over time. Um, so if you're going to have a full denture, you need to be missing all the teeth. You know, it's kind of self-explanatory. Um, in the upper right, you can see that when a tooth is there, you know, the jaw has kind of a, a rounded shape. When, and that's what you really want for a denture, because a denture is just like sitting over a saddle. That's what your gums are. They're a big saddle. And if you don't have a saddle, well, now the thing's going to flop around. Um, again, it's a long process. It's very similar to the uh, removable partial denture. Same kind of uh, things. Although, uh, in my opinion, making a good denture is an art form because you're trying to make something that one is going to look good, but it's got to feel good, and it's got to function well. And that's not always an easy thing to do. Um, so my, yeah. Oh well, you know, actually, it's interesting because. You can get 3D printed dentures now. There are labs are starting to, uh, they, you know, they can have uh, different filaments that are the color of teeth. And uh, so digital uh, dentures is something that is on the horizon. 
Um, I'm not aware of anybody that's doing them actively at the moment, but um, that is down the road. And if you can have something that you can print in your own office, uh, you know, you can imagine you could have a denture made or remade very quickly. Um, so 3D printing is, is kind of the, where things are going. And a lot of labs now are changing their investment from milling machines, things that take a big block and cut it all the way down, to things that now print it. Because if you think about it, you don't waste nearly as much material. It's like taking a tree to make a toothpick. Or alternatively, you can start with something with nothing and just make the toothpick. You know, so it's, it's a big difference. Um, the cost of a denture, and there are different qualities of denture. They have different teeth. and, and um, So the prices are, they range by quite a bit. Um, I would expect that most people, if they're going to have a denture, would like to have a nice one. And so it's going to be somewhere in that you know, $5,000 range. Um, and I will say that a lot of people do very well with dentures. Um, dentures have been around. They give you something, obviously, that you can chew with. Um, they can break, they can lose teeth, and so they do, are subject to needing repair. Uh, and also, everything changes as we get older, and not for the better. You don't suddenly develop more bone, you don't suddenly grow new teeth. Only thing that happens is the bone shrinks away and the gum tissue shrinks away, and then they don't fit. And so that's when you go in and have them relined. So, we're just going to go over the dentures here, our implant supported dentures real quickly. I like this slide. Um, I don't know how well you can see it, but it talks about just what can you eat based on what you have for teeth. And so in the far left, at about 15 pounds of bite force, it looks like cottage cheese and spaghetti. And I'm assuming those noodles are done al dente. They're not too hard because, um, but having said that, uh, I've known people that can eat anything with dentures. So. Uh, you know, some people just adapt better than others, but at that amount of bite force, that's really what you're kind of limited to. You can see if you get a snap-on denture, so now you got something that maybe a couple implants and you can snap it on there. Well, you've, you know, quad, well, at least tripled your, almost quadrupled your bite force, and now you're throwing in salmon and asparagus spears. And, you know, asparagus spears, I've had some pretty tough ones, so I can say that uh, that's pretty good biting. Um, and a lot of people will do that for a bottom denture because they tend to wobble all over the place. If you put two little implants here and they snap on, well, suddenly they don't go everywhere and you can actually use them more effectively. And it's a, uh, an economical way to go as far as implants. Um, revitalize, that just means you got a bunch of implants in and you either have it restored as bridges or you have um, plastic teeth or, or ceramic teeth that are screwed in place. So they never leave. And you can see suddenly you've got 90% of your chewing power back. And now we're talking about steak, not even the expensive steak. You can now chew the tough steak and um, almonds. I was looking at that.